Hi everybody, and welcome back to my channel. I'm Gio, and this week's story is called The Carousel. August 7th, Marcus. The Carousel was called the Renaissance of Dreams, and it was where I had met Alex four years ago. Today was our anniversary, and just like last year's anniversary, I spent it alone. Four years back, the carousel had been a piece of silver mirrors and painted exotic animals with large jewels and wild music and strobing lights. That's where I'm heading tonight. I snuck through a hole in the old chain link fence and into the parking lot covered with dried weeds. I had to be careful with my pack. I didn't want to break the wine bottle. The amusement park had seen better years. With the downturn in the economy three years ago, the owners had gone bankrupt, and the park had closed down. On a good night, the place had been filled with thousands of people. The roller coaster was known for being one of the top wooden coasters in the country. The Ferris wheel could be seen for miles, and the gravity drop ride had been very popular when it had worked. The place hadn't had a good night for three years. I jogged through the 2 a.m. darkness, keeping my phone off so no one from the street could see me, especially the night watchman. I had parked my car a few blocks away so no one would get suspicious. I hadn't been back since the place had closed down. It hadn't survived well during those three years. Back then, it had been magic. I was 19, Alex was 20. We had been goofing around with our friends, and for one crazy moment, we both rode the carousel together. I rode a pink giraffe. He rode a turquoise horse next to me. He slipped. I reached out and stopped his fall. That's how we met. A car drove past the fence I had snuck through. I ducked. I don't think they saw me. It is pretty dark. To be safe, I crept towards the main entry, sticking to any shadows along the way. Once, it had been a sci-fi castle with lots of strobing lights and spaceship sound effects, and people dressed as odd animal mascots. Now, it was an abandoned and boarded-up relic of happier dreams. I suspected Alex wasn't even in the States. I pulled myself up on the old turnstile gave a small kick that opened up one of the boards, and slunk through the hole. If security or the cops hadn't found me, I'd come out the same way. That night, the night I met Alex, we had ridden on the carousel at least twenty times. We tried out each animal, each carriage, and finally we settled on a cartoon replica of a Model T Ford and rode for hours. We hit it off and talked all night, his friends went their way, mine another, but when they came back for us, we still sat on the carousel, talking. I don't remember who kissed who first. I do remember enjoying it. I slunk through the shadows of the fairway, listening for any noise, especially footsteps. I didn't hear any, nor did I see any lights. I pulled out a small flashlight and walked over the broken glass and broken boards, and a lot of trash. The gangs had not been kind to this place. Graffiti marked almost every wall. Hopefully not the one that Alex and I had made. It wasn't very big. All it said was, Alex loves Marcus. That was my first stop. I had to see if the gangs had painted over it. They had covered everything else. Our small piece of art was on the back of the old ring toss stall. Somebody had shoved a bunch of old garbage cans in the way, so I had to find a side alley and edge my way through it. The wall was covered with graffiti all right, an intricate design in blues and golds that I couldn't decipher. I shone the light across it, looking for the small crack. Found it. The graffiti artists must have had a romantic moment because they had painted around it, even making a gold heart 
to surround and protect our names. I made my way back to the fairway. Air is clear, a voice said. Are you sure, Charlie? I shut my light off and ducked into the shadows. I don't see anybody, and I don't hear anybody, the voice said again. A security guard came into view, holding a flashlight that was brighter than the sun. If he flashed it at where I hid, he'd find me. I couldn't have that. I picked up a small rock and threw it as far as I could. It clattered against something. The flashlight pointed away from me, and the security guard walked in that direction. I heard something, Nelson, he said. A little voice came from his walkie-talkie. What? I don't know. Just a noise, he said. It's probably nothing. Double check. It's your fault things are messed up, the guy in the walkie-talkie said. I waited until he left, and, keeping my light off, I took a back way to the carousel. I passed the sugar shack, with its exterior decorated like a gingerbread house, then passed the place where the whirligig once stood, and passed the old haunted ride with old ghosts now sporting odd riding, and into the plaza that held the carousel. In my mind, I remembered it covered with lights and with old-fashioned Calliope music blaring from hidden speakers. It was like coming to the circus. Alex's job kept him overseas a lot. Most of the time I didn't know where he was, and he wasn't allowed to contact anyone. I hadn't seen my husband for more than a year. He was an underwater demolitions expert serving on the research vessel, Golden Hermes. They were off the coast of Italy somewhere, documenting the underwater ruins of an ancient city, too far from any cell tower for even a simple phone call. I had already figured out that that was a cover story for something else. I stared at the dark carousel, listened to the silence. Somewhere, a car honked. Nobody was around. I pulled my phone out and dialed his number. Italy was eight time zones away, which made it around ten in the morning where he was at. But I don't think he was anywhere near Italy. But I'd leave a message anyway and drink a toast. It rang three times before the machine said, leave a message. It's me, I said, and pulled the wine bottle out. I had figured out that I needed to be careful with what I had said. I wanted to wish you happy anniversary. Four years ago, today, we met. Do you remember? I'm sitting there right now. Guess what I brought. Listen carefully. I opened the wine and poured a glass. To us, I said. When you get back, we'll have a real toast and celebrate all night long. I love you, Alex. I hope your trip is everything you thought it would be. The message ended, and I hung up. Like most messages, he wouldn't get this one for weeks, and I wouldn't hear back for months. Sometimes, well, most times, he would show up unannounced. I hoped Alex loved what he was doing, because I missed him. My husband must be a deep cover operative working for some covert agency. I finished the wine, sealed up the bottle, and packed it away. If I was going to be depressed, I might as well be depressed on the carousel. The carousel was only a dark and lonely shadow. No power, no lights, no music, no screaming kids, no teenage girls taking a million selfies, no couples kissing or flirting. It smelled of machine grease and dust. I turned my flashlight back on. I stepped on the carousel, running my hand over the nearest dusty animal. It was a large carousel, with three layers of animals instead of the usual two. I walked past the various animals, remembering them as light and color and sound. The center column still had mirrors, but they'd been broken. The mirrors alternated with various pictures. The carousel had remained untouched by the graffiti artists. But by touch, I found the saddled giraffe I had ridden. Next to it was the horse Alex had ridden. I kept walking until I found the old cartoon version of a Model T Ford. I crept in, pulled out the wine, and poured myself another glass. Cheers, Alex. Stay safe, I said, 
and toasted his memory. Alex, March 27, 1185. I set the last of the charges and gave a thumbs up to my crew. They returned the gesture. The four of us were underwater, setting the last of the charges on the gray ship codenamed Epsilon. The shimmers worked perfectly. The greys had no way of knowing we were here. They didn't expect an attack. Who in this era, except for us, had any idea about explosives like this? I mean, it was the 12th century, late March even. We were off the coast of Japan, and if it weren't for our body armor and temporal stasis fields, we'd freeze to death in the water. The greys had come back in time to rewrite a bit of history. More specifically, they wanted the Tyra clan to win possession of Japan and stay in possession for centuries. That would have dramatically changed history, especially in 800 years. Japan would have become a world power, dominated World War II, and the shadow government of the Grey Incursion Force would eventually control the world. The Taira were losing the battle. They had retreated to Yoshima. It's called Takamatsu in the future, which was on the island Shikoku. The Greys planned on decimating the fleet, the Minamoto clan had sent a deal with the Tyra, and they almost did. We had to give the five remaining boats that were about to attack the chance they needed to succeed. History would prove the Minamoto commander, Yoshitsune, had a brilliant idea. He only needed a chance to see it through. Which is where we came in, the Saturn Project, a fancy way of not saying we were a temporal division of the government. Most people call this the Temps. My team had set all the explosives. Time to end this party. Saturn coned. Epsilon Delta Alpha Alpha 911. Initiate. Five minutes. That will not allow proper time to exit the blast range, Archangel, our computer AI, said. The designers had made his voice masculine and as soft and soothing as a hypnotherapist. We don't want to give the greys time to stop the explosion, I said. Acknowledged. Countdown commencing. Sinking with all devices, Archangel said. Okay, team. Swim like the world depends on it, I said, initiating the suits underwater maneuvering jets. You're the slow one, Alex, Lieutenant Nelson yelled. Looks like you'll be the last one to the blip. You get to buy the pizza tonight. Sorry, I'd rather have pizza with my husband, I said. The blip? Our way back to the 21st century. Technically, it was a temporarily stable point in both time and space that allowed for a safe chronological transition between two time periods. If a soldier tried to chrono jump elsewhere, anything could happen. My internal telemetry showed that Nelson was right. I was the last one. I drained the batteries as I engaged full thrust. Four minutes, thirty seconds, Archangel said. Charlie, the new kid, fell behind. Charlie, increase speed, I yelled. I'm at max, he said, but I'm losing charge. I'm not going to make it. Four minutes, Archangel said. As team leader, it was my duty to get him back. Three minutes, thirty seconds, Archangel said. Three minutes, Archangel said. The dark water prevented me from seeing anything. I had to rely on my instrumentation. Two minutes, thirty seconds, Archangel said. Two minutes. Archangel said. A lighter colored humanoid form appeared. Great. It took me two minutes to find him. Something had damaged Charlie's suit and he was gliding through the water at three quarter speed. Specifically, the battery modules had a long gash bisecting them. He must have run into something. Or something fired at him and got a near miss. Only the greys were in the area. Archangel, emergency scan this location, all bands and wavelengths, highest priority, I said. Scanning, Archangel said. I had undamaged battery packs. I quickly switched mine with Charlie's. Gray incursion craft in stealth mode approaching your position, Archangel reported. One kilometer above and descending. I estimate they will reach you before you reach blip point. One minute thirty, Archangel said. Charlie, go. I'll buy you some time. What about you, sir? Charlie said. That's an order, I yelled. Yes, sir, Charlie said and disappeared in the darkness. Archangel, ready primary weapons and temporal drive, I said. 
The backpack swiveled down and a long tube emerged. Green lights flashed in my display. Weapons ready, Archangel said. You have passed the safety margin for return. Sorry, Marcus, I whispered, and positioned the targeting reticle on the, in on the incoming gray ship. Underwater, my weaponry lacked range and power, but it would distract the gray ship long enough for my team to leave this time period. I fired. The thin burst of the railgun exploded in a long stream in the water. The pellets it fired were only the size of a pin, but at the rate they fired, they didn't need to be bigger than that. Archangel, continual tracking, gray craft, and continual bombardment, I said. Affirmative. One minute, Archangel said. Tell me when the others reach the blip, I yelled. Send this message. Marcus, I'm sorry I can't make it back. I love you. Be safe. Alex, I'm coming back for you, Nelson said. No, you're not, I said. You're in charge. Get everybody out of here. I couldn't hear his reply as my railgun went into full automatic bombardment. Archangel filtered out the noise and flooded my body with endorphins. I screamed as I fired every single round I had. The team has made it to the blip, Archangel said. Thirty seconds. Alert. Several gray units are entering the area with the explosive charges. Immediate detonation and activate temporal shift. The world went yellow. A shock wave shoved the gray craft sideways and to the ocean floor. It flashed red and atmosphere exploded out of it. The same thing would happen to me in a moment. Emergency, Archangel said. The world shifted into the rainbow spectrum. The colors swirled and melded around me. The temporal shift had begun, but it also included part of the shock wave. Emergency override engaged, Archangel said. Initiating emergency repair procedures. Initiating emergency protocols. Initiating emergency beacon. Alert. Alert. Units off course. Alex. August 7th. Now. I woke in med bay, opened my eyes, and shut them because the world spun. Two IVs emerged from my arm. A blood pressure monitor was on my finger. Several sensors were attached to my chest and head and stomach. A machine beeped in time with my heart. My ribs ached. So did my head. Sleeping Beauty has woken up, Nelson said from my bedside. Did everyone make it back, I asked. We did, Nelson said, but you almost didn't. What do you mean, I asked. You time shifted and you weren't at the blip, and you were in an explosion. And didn't have full power, Nelson said. Archangel was lucky to get you back. Negative, Archangel said through the room speakers. There was no luck involved. It required an alternative trajectory and temporal entry point. No entry point? How is it different? I asked. Alex, it won't seem like much time passed for you, but for us, it's been a year. I'd lost a year? I looked at the ring on my hand. Marcus must think I'm dead, I said. No, Nelson said. Psych profiles indicates he believes you are on some kind of secret mission. Marcus doesn't know about any of this, I said. As per regulations, Archangel said. I have to get out of here and find him, I said. And tell him what, Nelson said. I don't know, I said. Archangel, is my suit operational? Affirmative. Batteries are at full charge. Your phone has received a recent communication. Do you wish to hear? How recent? I asked. Fifty-seven minutes ago, Archangel said. Marcus's voice came over the, the speakers. I heard the message he left me. He still waited for me. Track down his location and prepare a spatial jump, I said. Is that a good idea? Commander King said as she entered. That's my husband. What have you told him? Nothing, she said. Our job requires complete secrecy. If the Greys found him, they'd dissect him molecule by molecule to get at any information he might know. Do you want to risk that? It would be kinder to let him think you disappeared, or even died. I took a deep breath. If I thought that way, I would have let Charlie die. I know what I have to do, and I need to make things right with Marcus. It would be easier if I had your authorization. She nodded and walked out of the room. 
Nelson, get Charlie and the team. It's time to bend a regulation, I said. Sounds fun, Nelson said, and laughed. Archangel, this is what I need, I said, climbing out of the hospital bed. Marcus, August 7th. Now. Four in the morning. Over the last two hours, I had drunk the entire bottle of wine. Alex never called me back, but I didn't expect him to. Wherever he was, he was doing something important. He'd call me when he could, or even show up at some random time. Archangel, initiate primary sequence, a voice said. Affirmative, full charge in three minutes, another voice said. The carousel started to move. The rows of lights lit up and flashed. The animals began rising up and falling down. They weren't covered in dust and dirt anymore, but were clean and sparkling, like new. The mirrors weren't broken. The murals on the side of the column could have been painted yesterday. The air smelled of cotton candy and popcorn. The music played. The classic Calliope tunes that sounded like an old circus. A voice said, Ticket, please, Marcus. Impossible. It was Alex. Standing by our ride. How did you know I was here? I asked. You left me a message, Alex said, taking the seat beside me. His hair was tousled, he hadn't shaved in at least a couple of weeks, and he wore a light blue polo with white slacks. His face was bruised, and he moved stiffly, one hand holding his ribs. He had bloodshot eyes and pale skin, and his arms had the needle marks of an IV. We kissed and held each other. It had been a year since I had seen him, spoken to him, held him. Have you been in the hospital? I asked. Long story, but I made it back, Alex said. I know you can't talk about it, I asked, but did everything go well? No, Alex said. That's why I'm late. How long can you stay this time? I asked. The carousel spun. The light blared. The music made me want to laugh. Sitting here with Alex made my world right again. Except the world outside of the carousel had changed. Instead of a decaying amusement park, we were in a plaza made of glass and white metal. The carousel provided the only bit of color. It slowly spun to a stop. Four narrow rods surrounded the carousel, and a person manned each rod, including the night watchman. What just happened? I asked. Alex took my hand and helped me out of the Model T. He escorted me off of the carousel. I think it's about time I told you what I do for a living, Alex said. More specifically, a woman said, approaching us. She held out her hand in welcome. Marcus, it's all about time. Thank you for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time. Peace.